A lot of people I talk to who aren't especially politically or philosophically inclined try to stake out a position of neutrality. They take a cursory look at what gets called the left and what gets called the right, or the two sides of whatever issue, and conclude things like, both sides are wrong, or it's too complicated to take sides. It sounds wise because you're aloof from the real conflict, able to think more clearly than people on the ground. Often, however, people who talk like that don't know much about either side and aren't aware of any other sides. It's possible they're being manipulated by false equivalences. This video is about the limits of talking about both sides and where this thinking has brought us in the discourse on Palestine. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel rated best YouTube channel to watch while playing golf. Both sidesing, or BSing, is presenting two options, two sides of some issue, and implying they're of roughly equal magnitude when they're not. Talking about both sides of a conflict as if they were equally guilty in that conflict is a very limited use if we care about getting to the heart of the matter. We tend to want to pick sides, and if we're told how to think by one side, we probably join that side. But to understand the issue, we need to recognize there are various possible points of view on it. If I hear about a war from the one newspaper I read, or even if I read all the newspapers from this one country I live in, I only know one way of thinking about this war. I might think it's good that we civilized people are using guns to show the uncivilized the correct way to live. If I want to read more about an issue, but I'm under the impression there's only one way of approaching the topic, or one way and the obviously wrong way, I'll probably go in thinking I just have to read the right people, the people who write from the correct perspective, and be on the lookout for signs the author is on the wrong side. But what if there are other sides? If we're talking about philosophy and how to organize society, there are innumerable sides. Powerful people and their followers want you to think there's only one correct way, the way things are, or the way the leaders promise it'll be. And that's why they have to use force to implement it. And there are one or two alternatives that would clearly lead to everyone dying. The powerful control the state. I talked a bit about the state in my last video, but I didn't mention among its various monopolies was one on speaking for people. The state says it represents the people in the territory it rules. Because there are other territorial monopolies claiming to represent the people they preside over, each one might be forced to negotiate with the other. We get told the two sides are meeting to discuss something. Well, there could be countless other sides to the conflict, other perspectives on what should be done. But if you watch the news, you hear about one or possibly two. This way of thinking keeps the scope of our thoughts confined to whatever the one side we're supposed to support says is acceptable. If we didn't think and do what they say, the other side, the bad guys, might take over. People who want power over you will present you with options in order to limit your action. When a critical thinker knows, there's always another option. A consequence of restricting our thinking this way that might be familiar to you is the with us or against us mindset. You can only be one of these two things, so which is it? Do you support Israel? No? Then you must support Hamas and everything it does. You don't like Hamas either? then you have to support Israel. Actually, no, I don't. I support people who want to live free. That's most people, but not most people with power. I want Palestinians to be free, free from living under siege, free to have their own land and live how they want. See, when you value solidarity, it's easy to figure out who to support. It's easy to see beyond the us or them rhetoric to the innocent people caught in the crossfire. They're all other sides to this fight, but they don't get a voice because we're not allowed to know there are more than two sides. 
we get told they're self-appointed spokespeople represent them. So if Hamas says something anti-Semitic, Palestinians are all a bunch of anti-Semites. Israel can now add to its list of demands that people de-radicalize to the extent that no Palestinian feels any animosity towards anyone else before Israel will lift the siege. Now, I'm not about to defend Hamas or the attack on October 7th, 2023, but if you don't know the century or more of history behind this conflict, you might not realize the enormous difference between Hamas and the IDF, or why there might be more than two sides. If you don't know how much two million people are suffering in Gaza and why, you might think each party has an equal grievance against the other. In fact, if you just listen to their words and inherently trust the gleaming white officialness of the state press conference, you might favor Israel, or maybe criticize Israel as also wrong, but not so wrong that anything should change. Hamas talks like they want to terrorize people. If you just watch the news, with its fake attempt at showing both sides, you might think Hamas's rhetoric can justify the things Israel does, especially when contrasted with Israel's carefully crafted image as this free democracy where everyone is welcome. You can choose between the legitimate state with uniforms and parliaments and fighter jets and everything, which says it believes in human rights and minimizing casualties, or the brown men in masks speaking scary words who the news calls a terrorist group. You might conclude the IDF has to shower Gaza with bombs. Hamas is evil. Sure, killing ordinary people is bad, but if they didn't, things might be even worse. Both sides are wrong. Better not change anything or even get involved. And that's how to arrive back at the status quo every time. That's how we train ourselves to think and do what the powerful want us to, accepting rather than resisting. Now I just need a simplistic explanation that wraps up the whole issue so I don't have to think about it anymore. How about, it's complicated. Perfect. But is this really a war between two sides? Let's look at what we know. First, Hamas is not a state. It attempts to claim a monopoly on force and administration in Gaza, but some other requirements of being a state that Hamas doesn't have include sovereignty, a military, and being recognized by other states. And in case you had hopes for it, the way it's currently being offered to Palestinians, the so-called two-state solution, the deal on offer since 1993, would not permit a Palestinian authority to build a military either. The deals offered to Palestinians, or more accurately, whatever representative the imperial powers choose to deal with, gets weaker with every decade, as Palestinians' bargaining power has dropped, and they found themselves with fewer and fewer state allies. One of the main reasons for the attack on October 7th was probably to sabotage the rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So unlike states, Palestine or Hamas doesn't have a military. So it doesn't have tanks and ships and radars and missile defense systems or any kind of munitions that could defend against the cascade of bombs that have been raining down on Gaza. This confusing CNN article says how deadly Hamas's arsenal is in the headline. And yet the article starts with, Homemade rockets, modified AK-47s, decades-old Soviet machine guns. How can they even defend a city block with that? To call it the Israel-Palestine conflict or war like supposedly neutral media do is to imply Hamas or some other Palestinian people could prevail through military means, to send in multiple divisions, then take and hold territory, occupy cities, install puppet governments, and other things the winning side does after a war. Hamas has no capacity to blockade another state, to deny it food, water, and electricity. It's a war, but it's not a war between Hamas and Israel. It's Israel's war on the Palestinian people. 
If you think of Hamas and Israel as the two sides, it's easy to say both sides are wrong. But let's not end our thinking there. Are they the only two sides? Well, let's come back to that. The two sides we're presented with do plenty you can criticize, but they're too unevenly matched to compare. It's like comparing a dog with a crocodile. They can both bite, but one side can bite way harder. As a result, neither the IDF nor Palestinian resistance attack each other on even ground. Hamas and Islamic Jihad and some others carried out a surprise offensive because that's the only way you can hurt a vastly stronger force, by hitting its weak spots. Israel, meanwhile, faces no challenge when showering bombs on crowded civilian areas. It feels like 9-11 all over again. Is that what war is now? Angry people commit one ostentatious terrorist attack and the response is thousands of smaller terrorist attacks? Does anyone really think that's how you end the cycle of violence? Or do they just feel the need to look tough all the time? I don't understand why it's so obvious to everyone that taking revenge on people who weren't involved is a legitimate response to terrorism, or anything, really. How could it be okay to target schools, mosques, hospitals, and ambulances? Why does Israel target journalists? Is it the same reason the US did in Iraq, and states at war around the world do? Why is it excusable to target a civilian convoy fleeing an area being bombed after the IDF promised to try real hard not to? Because Hamas? And this keeps happening. Every couple of years, Israel decides to punish everyone in Gaza collectively because some of them have been firing rockets into Israel. All their excuses rely on the assumption of collective guilt. The Palestinian people voted for Hamas. Well, you know, some Palestinians who were alive at the time did it anyway, and therefore Palestinians are a bunch of terrorists. Those people were near a member of Hamas, so we blew them all up. As such, it's hard to buy the argument that Israel is just defending itself. How's bombing civilians with no capacity to hurt you defending yourself? Only if you assume there are no civilians, and it's just fine to kill indiscriminately. It's true, any of them could be the next terrorist, but where do you think these terrorists come from? Obviously, Palestinians want to fight back, but you can't do that on your own, so you cast around for groups who seem to be fighting back. I don't know if I've said this yet, but... I don't support Hamas or Islamic Jihad. I know how important it is to Zionists that you mention that. But how could you fail to see why people would join them? Can you put yourself in other people's shoes just for a minute? If your friends and family and their friends and family and everyone you know is being punished for the crime of being Palestinian, would you just sit back and hope things got better? When people claim rockets being fired into Israel are a good reason to kill tens of thousands of people, they're creating a false equivalence. And they're putting the cart before the horse. Those rockets are a result of living under occupation. People don't like being squeezed every day of their lives. They don't want to live under a blockade forever. So they fight back against their oppressors. I know, who does that? They must just teach their kids to hate. Those rockets have also been called a war crime for the same reason as some of Israel's bombing raids. They're indiscriminate and inevitably hit civilians. But the rate that they land anywhere near anyone tends to be one-tenth or one-twentieth of Israel's numbers, or in the case of Operation Cast Lead, one-hundredth. That's how disproportionate this violence is. That's how deadly those rockets are. I've been hearing for years how Israel has precision-guided munitions, and how it has these teams that review the targets and judge they're the right ones. And no one points out these factors all but prove Israel targets civilians. They could change targets and redirect the missiles, but they don't. When a three-year-old girl is killed in a home in Gaza, it's because someone in the army decided it wasn't a big deal for her to be killed, that it was a price worth paying in order to hit another target. They're not just trying to kill card-carrying members of Hamas. 
Israel wants to cause maximum damage and kill as many people as it can until it can be forced to the negotiating table. Or look at the disparity in incarceration. As of September 2023, before the current exchange of terror began, Israel held over 4,000 prisoners on security grounds. At the start of the fighting, Ma'an News reported 5,200 Palestinians in Israeli prisons and 1,300 held indefinitely without trial. On October 7th, Hamas and whoever else was involved kidnapped something like 250 people. I know what you're thinking. One side is a state and calls it arrest and detention. So it's not kidnapping. See, Hamas is worse, or at least just as bad, because they kidnap. Kidnapping is illegal. Lawful detention, for however long, is lawful. Since 1967, Israel has arrested about a million Palestinians, or 40% of the male population. But Palestinians sometimes kidnap, so both sides? The attack on October 7th involved some horrific and unforgivable violence. However, it doesn't follow that the correct response is to kill as many civilians as possible. That would only be the answer if the question was how to wipe out the whole group of people. People have been using the word genocide more this time around, so much so the government of South Africa is taking Israel to The Hague. Now South Africa is a side in this fight. They could have chosen to charge Israel with war crimes, they could easily prove Israel targets civilians. If you charge a state with genocide, you've got to have a lot of evidence and confidence it'll stick. This isn't just an empty political gesture. Not that Israel would be forced to abide by the court's ruling, because the court has no enforcement mechanism. The law isn't really for punishing states, but empowering states to punish individuals. A ruling that Israel's committing genocide could hurt the people who made the decision to commit it if a state threatens to arrest them, which has happened before. Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London in 1998, and a warrant was issued for the arrest of Israel's own Tsipi Livni for war crimes in 2009 in connection with her role in Operation Cast Lead. Like everything complicated, there are more than two sides to this issue. The IDF and Hamas are two sides, but many governments are involved, especially the US and Iran, along with Hezbollah in Lebanon and Ansar Allah or the Houthis in Yemen. They complicate things. Your both sides' theories don't work anymore. Different actors in a conflict have different interests and incentives. The US is not Israel. Iran is not Hamas. Nor are Palestinians in general. Hamas. Every unaffiliated Palestinian is another side with their own view of the situation. You can't tell me the Palestinians reject peace just because an organization claiming to represent them rejects peace. I know it's tempting to assume an intellectual, enlightened posture of both sides are equally bad so we shouldn't take sides. That thinking tends to obscure the history of the problem and render everyone fighting for peace and freedom invisible. I don't think we should support institutions of power, states like Israel or political parties like Hamas, but should join the ongoing fight against power and oppression. Right now, that means ending the siege of Gaza. Thank you.